Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for um, Legal Aid Queensland's webinar today. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the um, traditional custodians of the land where our Brisbane office stands today, the Turrbal and Yagara and Yugarabal people. Um, I'd like to pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits and offer a special welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Um, we'd also like to recognise uh, the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play in our community and in improving our legal system and recognise that these lands have always been places of ceremony, of teaching, research and learning. Um, so again, thank you for joining us today for our October webinar, uh, Workplace Sexual Harassment, Helping Clients Access Legal Help. Today presenting our webinar, we have Gillian Welsh um, and Amelia Sturton. They are both lawyers in our Civil Justice Services Division. Um, and I'm just gonna run through some quick um, housekeeping before I hand over the presentation to them. So this webinar is for community legal education purposes and is aimed at community health and education workers. Um, I'd also like to just note that the webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, I also just wanted to note that the webinar will contain content related to sexual harassment and will involve discussions around topics including unwanted sexual advances, harassment, stalking and identity-based discrimination. Um, we acknowledge that this content can be challenging and we'd just like to encourage viewers who might find these topics difficult to consider maybe skipping this webinar and joining us next month instead. Um, we also encourage our viewers to look after their safety and mental wellbeing and to reach out to some support services if need be, which we've, um, we've, we've listed a few here on the slides for you. Um, so our, we have a lot of other community legal education resources available on our website, um, and there's a link to those which are available in our slide handouts, which you can download from the toolbar in the handout section. If you're having any technical issues today, um, the best place to reach out to is the GoToWebinar customer support team. That's the platform that we're using. Um, and there's a link available to them also in the handouts. Um, again, I just note that the YouTube, sorry, the video will be available on YouTube afterwards. So if you are having technical difficulties, you'll be able to come back and um, view the webinar later. Um, we are also very much welcoming questions today, which we'll run through in our Q&A session at the end of the webinar. I just want to note that um, we can't answer specific legal questions about clients today. Um, but we do encourage general questions that can benefit everybody in the room. Um, feel free to type those questions into the question box at any time and we will come back to them at the end of the webinar. So I guess jump into our first poll now, um, which is, uh, are you of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander origin? So just bear with me while I pop this one up for you. Okay, so the poll is live now. We've got some responses coming through. Okay, so I'm just going to close it up because we've had everybody um, answer that question. We have a few of these questions um, today. Um, it's just to give us an idea of um, who our audience is and help us to understand who we're speaking to. Um, so then we'll move into our next poll, which is which region do you work in? Southeast Queensland, Far North Queensland, Regional Queensland, or outside of Queensland. Um, I just wanted to note that whilst we will be discussing some federal legislation today, um, we are also going to be referring to state-based legislation, and when we do so, it's related to Queensland only, which looks like most of our audience is um, within Queensland, lots in Southeast Queensland. Just a few more seconds, because we've almost got everybody here. So I'll just give it a few more seconds. And then I'm just going to close that poll off now and share the results for you so everybody can see where we're from. Um, just when I'm sharing results of the slides, we aren't able to see the Auslan interpretation, but that will pop back up once we go back into the webinar. Okay. And then we'd just like to know um, what your role is, if that's okay. Um, so we've got 100% answered other, um, which is very great. Um, it's great to have a nice diverse range of people with us today. Um, so now 
Thank you very much for taking part in those polls. I'll just um, hand over now to our presenters to run through the webinar. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us today. So what Dillian and I are hoping you will learn today is a general understanding of sexual harassment at both state and federal levels. We will also touch on some recent changes in federal law that are really positive developments. We're also going to go through some case studies with you. If you have any questions about those, you can raise them and, and we can address them at the end. And we'll also briefly touch on when sexual harassment might also be a criminal offence. And lastly, we'll talk about how Legal Aid Queensland can help um, any clients that are affected by sexual harassment. Thanks, Amelia. So <clears throat> sexual harassment um, under the federal definition, a person sexual, sexually harasses another person if they make an unwelcome sexual advance, make an unwelcome request for sexual favours, or engage in unwelcome conduct of a sexual na nature to the person harassed. So this is drawn from the Sex Discrimination Act, which is the national law. The Queensland law, um, which is the Anti-Discrimination Act, is broadly similar, but also includes when a person makes a remark with sexual connotations relating to the other person. Um, whether the conduct is unwelcome is considered from the perspective of the person being harassed. And there is a second part of the definition, which Amelia will now touch on. Thanks, Gillian. So the conduct or the remarks need to have occurred in circumstances where a reasonable person, having regard to all the circumstances, would have anticipated the possibility that the person being harassed would be offended, humiliated or intimidated. And further, moving on, so in working, out, in working out whether a reasonable person would have anticipated that possibility, um, there are relevant circumstances to take into account. And so some of those include the age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, intersex status, marital or relationship status, religious belief, race, colour or na national or ethnic origin of the person harassed. Another really important consideration is the relationship between the person harassed and the person who made the advance or request or who engaged in the conduct. And this goes to the power dynamics between the two people. Um, in addition, any disability of the person harassed and any other relevant circumstances. So there are a lot of considerations um, to think about in determining whether a reasonable person would have anticipated the possibility that the person harassed would be intimidated, humiliated or offended by the conduct. So sexual harassment can be a single incident or it can happen more than once or be something that is a number of, of um, different types of actions. So we have listed a couple of examples on the slides. Sexual harassment can include fondling, pinching, embracing, grabbing. Just moving on to a few more examples. I'm not going to read them all out um, on the slides for you, but um, may also include requests for sexual favours, repeated requests for dates, which is something we've got an example of um, later on in the presentation, which we'll discuss a little bit more. Um, sexual gestures, leering and staring, questions about a person's sex life and sex-based insults. So just important to note that sexual harassment doesn't include mutual or consensual conduct of a sexual nature. So in Queensland, sexual harassment is unlawful in any circumstance. It's not limited to particular areas of life. Um, the way that the Anti-Discrimination Act is drafted, it's unlawful everywhere and in every circumstance that you could come across. Um, under the federal legislation, it is unlawful in specific circumstances of public life, including employment, including pre-employment, and so the coverage of employment is very broad. It includes circumstances where two people who do not work for the same employer or where not everyone involved is working. For example, the person harassed is working when it happens or the person doing the harassing is at work. 
Um, it may also cover a range of acts which occur outside the traditional office or workplace if there is a connection with the employment. Um, it's also covered in education. So within education, students who are 16 or over must not sexually harass other students and staff of their own educational institution or in some circumstances, staff and students of other educational institutions. Um, also goods and service, services and goods, accommodation and other areas covered at the national level include buying and selling land, membership of clubs, and the administration of Commonwealth laws and programs. <clears throat> Turning next to vicarious liability of an employer. So under both the national and state laws, there is a way to hold uh, the employer of a person who is alleged to have sexually harassed someone else responsible for their actions. So it's where it's done in connection with the employment um, uh, and or the other way it's looked at is in the course of work or while acting as an agent. This is something where people should be getting legal advice. Um, and so unless the employer can show that they either took reasonable steps um, within the state legis the state jurisdiction or within the, the federal took all reasonable steps to prevent their employee or agent from doing those acts of sexual harassment, they may be fined vicariously liable. And that can be important for trying to hold an employer responsible for the, for the acts of their employee. Turning now to one of the recent federal changes that we will touch on a little bit more in a moment. Um, is a new mechanism um, which allows um, a person who is in the workplace and experiencing sexual harassment to make an application to the Fair Work Commission to try and have that harassment um, stopped and to have the matter resolved. So it's a form of early intervention that may help an individual worker to engage with their employer to resolve the matter quickly and inexpensively with the goal of restoring a safe workplace. So it's most relevant to people who are still employed and who wish to stay in that employment, but would like the employment to be safe and would, would like the sexual harassment to stop. Um, it's supposed to be a fairly quick process. So once an application is made to the Fair Work Commission, um, the Fair Work Commission needs to start acting on that application within 14 days. Turning to the complaint options <coughs> about sexual harassment. So within Queensland, uh, complaints about sexual harassment can be made to the Queensland Human Rights Commission. And the time limit for making a complaint is within 12 months of the conduct occurring. Uh, complaints under the national law, the Sex Discrimination Act, need to be made to the Australian Human Rights Commission and the time frame there is within 24 months of the conduct occurring. So it's important to understand that you can't make a complaint to both of these commissions and uh, people who've experienced sexual harassment should be getting advice um, hopefully prior to making a complaint um, so they understand the different functions um, or they understand the different pros and cons of the various jurisdictions. Um, both jurisdictions run uh, in, in a, a broadly similar way once a complaint is accepted. So both will hold uh, a conciliation conference which is a private mediation between the complainant and the respondents. Um, facilitated by an employee of the Commission um, called a conciliator, where they are brought together in a private setting um, that's confidential and uh, with the view to seeing if the complaint can be resolved before the need to refer it on uh, to, to a body which would determine whether sexual harassment has actually occurred. In the QHRC, uh, the, the conciliation is compulsory for um, the respondents to attend, uh, but it is, it's optional at the Australian Human Rights Commission um, process. 
it does provide the parties an opportunity to resolve the complaint before it needs to go to court and be proven. And there are various possible outcomes that people can seek within the conciliation process. Because it's a it's an agreement that the parties come to, it, there are really, it's a very broad scope to make an agreement to agree to uh, a range of different outcomes. Some common outcomes might include um, an apology and that could be verbal within the conciliation or it might be a request for a written apology. Um, other common uh, outcomes that someone might ask for might include um, updating or introducing policies regarding sexual harassment in the workplace if those don't currently exist. Um, training for the people who were involved in the sexual harassment um, and as well, one of the very common outcomes sought is an amount of compensation. And so um, the amount of compensation, I think, is an important thing for um, th people to know about. Um, so there has been an increase in the amount of compensation in, in recent years. Um, there was a, a key case which was decided in the federal jurisdiction um, called Richardson, Richardson and Oracle. Uh, which was determined in 2014 and there was an amount awarded uh, as compensation regarded as general damages for the sexual harassment which occurred of $130,000 and this was increased from uh, an original decision um, awarding $18,000 and this case has really demonstrated um, that this type of conduct um, is, is very serious. The um, community expectations dictate that when these sorts of things happen to people, uh, though there is, um, there can be an amount of compensation that recognises the, the hurt and humiliation that these, um, these kinds of actions cause. So uh, following on from that, there have been a number of other decisions um, determined within the federal jurisdiction and also in the Queensland jurisdiction. Uh, in 2019, um, another decision awarded $120,000 of general damages and $50,000 in aggravated damages. That's a decision uh, referred to as Hill and Hughes. Um, another decision in the Queensland jurisdiction, which was decided last year in 2021, is the decision of Golding and Sipple and the Laundry Chute. Um, where the amount of general and aggravated damages uh, was increased to 130,000. Um, and that was on, an, on appeal from the original amount of, 30, 000, of around 30,000 um, at first instance. So those sorts of amounts uh, recognise the seriousness um, and uh, that's why we think it's important to refer clients to get advice about what's happened to them. So if the conciliation process is unsuccessful, there are other options for people affected um, to continue to pursue their complaint. So if a person has complained in the Queensland Human Rights Commission, they can refer their matter on to the Queensland Industrial Relations Commission if the sexual harassment is employment related or to the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. What's really important to note, however, is that there are strict timeframes to make those applications. So in Queensland, you have uh, 28 days from the date that the commission declares that the complaint can't be conciliated. So that there'll be a document that's provided. And so from that, you have 28 days to make that complaint. If the complaint is filed in the federal ju jurisdiction at the Australian Human Rights Commission and conciliation is unsuccessful, then a person has 60 days from the date that the conciliator or the commission sorry, terminates the um, complaint, then a person has 60 days to, to pursue the complaint in court. So an application would be needed would be made to the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court of Australia. So we just wanted to really emphasise that there are strict timeframes, um, so it's really important um, if a person is at this stage of the process and they haven't yet had legal advice that they're referred to get legal advice that they can consider 
um, whether you know making that next step is a, is the best option for them. Moving on to uh, the legal action of victimisation. So this is a separate um, legal action to a sexual harassment um, complaint. Um, and you're protected from detrimental treatment because of action taken or not taken in relation to sexual harassment. So it also um, includes um, threatening um, or causing detriment to another person because they refused to do something against the law, complained or intended to complain about something that contravened the law, is or has been involved in a proceeding, um, and are believed to have done or intend to do any of the above. Um, so uh, it's important to refer clients um, if they raise an issue in their workplace um, about being sexually harassed and then they're treated poorly. Um, not only will they have options um, under the protections against victimisation, they might have other options in relation to uh, protections under the Fair Work Act. So it's very important that um, if uh, there are people you are working with who've experienced this when they've raised something at work, that they're referred for advice. Okay, so turning to the Respect at Work report, um, this was a report that was handed down by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission fairly recently and it outlines the results of a national inquiry into sexual harassment in the workplace. So it's available online. You can go and have a look at it if you'd like. Um, it's, it was, it's been really important in this area. Um, the inquiry's terms of reference included reviewing and reporting on, among various factors, the prevalence, nature, and reporting of sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. The, um, sorry, the drivers of workplace sexual harassment, existing measures and good practices, and importantly, provided a number of recommendations to address sexual harassment in the workplace. So as we've touched on last year, the federal government introduced changes to federal legislation, the Sex Discrimination Act and the Fair Work Act to implement some of the recommendations that were in this report. Um, so just touching on the most important ones, um, we've already talked about the ability for a worker now to who is being sexually harassed at work to apply to the Fair Work Commission for an order to stop sexual harassment at work. So that was one of the changes. Another really important change was the extension of the time frame for a person to make a complaint um, to the Australian Human Rights Commission in regards to sex, sex discrimination or sexual harassment. So that's been increased to 24 months, as Gillian's already noted earlier on, which is significantly longer than the time frame in Queensland. And one of the other introductions um, was to clarify that um, sexual harassment in connection with a person's work is a valid reason for their dismissal. There are some additional uh, <clears throat> uh, legislative recommendations which have been introduced with the, the current anti-discrimination and human rights legislation amendment respect at work bill of 2022. Um, and so this bill uh, introduces a positive duty on employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to prevent sex discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, it also introduces a protection against um, uh, a hostile workplace on the basis of sex. Um, and so that might include things where um, there are lewd jokes or other uh, conduct in the workplace that might not necessarily be directed at a person, um, but makes it a very difficult workplace to be in um, because of that person's sex. Um, it also, the, the bill also pro, uh, proposes that uh, all federal discrimination uh, laws would also have the 24 month time limit to bring complaints. And so that would apply to race discrimination, age discrimination and disability discrimination uh, complaints as well. And a, a very important consideration for legal advice, legal advisors, um, and I know that there are a few solicitors who've registered today, even though this, webinar is directed for community health and education workers, um, is the way that uh, there is a proposed change to the way costs will be 
uh, dealt with in the federal jurisdiction, which will be important um, moving forward. Okay, so we're just going to jump into um, another poll now. So I'll just pop that. Um, so Charlie is studying at university. A fellow student sits beside Charlie during lectures and makes sexual remarks about other students in class and comments on Charlie's appearance. Charlie also finds out through mutual friends that this peer has told multiple people that they're going to sleep with Charlie. Charlie feels uncomfortable. Is this sexual harassment? Um, so I'm just launching the poll there now to see what everybody thinks. Just give it over a few more seconds. We've got some good answers coming through. It looks like most people think that this is sexual harassment. Um, okay, so just a few more seconds. And then I'll hand over to um, our presenters to comment on the answer for us. So I'll just share those results though. Um, so most people thought that this was sexual harassment. Thanks. Uh, so I think looking at the scenario, we don't have a whole lot of detail about uh, exactly what's been said to Charlie. And I think looking at the separate uh, types of actions and comments made, it may be that um, certain things that are in the scenario are more likely to be found uh, sexual to be sexual harassment. Um, some of the things we would probably need more information to know whether um, something might be considered uh, a reasonable person might uh, anticipate the possibility that Charlie would be humiliated, offended or intimidated by the conduct. Um, so it is turning back to thinking about the circumstances that need to be considered. We know that this is a fellow student, um, so not necessarily in a position of power in relation to Charlie. Um, but that's that's an important consideration as well. Um, we also don't really have sufficient information about what's said to Charlie about his appearance to know if this might meet the definition um, of sexual harassment. So um, the, the question about whether Charlie finding out through mutual friends that this peer has told a number of people they're going to sleep with Charlie. Um, Comments of a sexual nature about the person which are communicated to others rather than to the person themselves may be in, at the Queensland level um, considered to be co uh, comments with sexual connotations in relation to the person um, if, it's re if the, the person would reasonably anticipate that um, you know, the person is going to find out that this is said about them. And so there has been uh, a decision in Queensland which uh, considered uh, a, a broadly similar circumstance, um, which found that when comments were made about someone and that person then found out about the comments, um, <clears throat> it was found in those circumstances to be sexual harassment. This is quite a technical question and it's really important that clients um, are referred for advice about what's been said to them and about them um, to, to understand whether what they've experienced is sexual harassment and um, get advice about what their next steps might be. Okay, thanks Gillian. Um, we've got the second poll here. So this one is, Paul is a social worker. During a house visit to a client, the client paid carer suggests that she and Paul go on a date and he declines. It only happened once. Is this sexual harassment? So the question, the answers are yes, it doesn't have to be repeated to be sexual harassment. No, sexual harassment has to happen multiple times. Or maybe it depends on what the carer said to Paul. So I'm just going to launch that poll now so we can see what everybody thinks. And give it a few seconds for answers to come through. So at the moment it's looking like um, people think that maybe it'll depend on what the care has said to Paul. I'll just give it a few more seconds to see if anybody else wants to submit an answer. Um, still looking mostly like we think it's a maybe. Um, just a couple more seconds. Okay, so I'll close that poll off now and then I'll share the results for you all. Um, and then I'll just um, ask Gillian and Amelia to give us their thoughts. Thank you. So I guess the first point to make is 
that generally speaking, um, sexual conduct does not need to be repeated to meet the definition of sexual harassment. But as Gillian pointed to in the previous example, the circumstances are, are really relevant. Um, and in the context of a person being asked once on a date, um, usually if, you know, depending on whether anything else was said, usually if it's asked in a respectful and appropriate way, then it wouldn't be sexual harassment. But that's very different to a person making repeated requests for dates um, over a period of time. So it's just, I guess, being, being careful considering, considering the circumstances. Um, in this scenario, we'd also be really interested in knowing therefore whether or not the carer said anything else or did anything else alongside that request for a date, um, which is why um, we, we provided the answer maybe. It depends on what the carer said to Paul because those circumstances are, are really relevant. It might change things if um, the carer had done anything else. Um, we also just wanted to point out that this scenario has occurred in, in the workplace even though Paul and the paid carer um, appear to be employed by different employees, they're, they're at work. So um, what that means is Paul, if he did decide to make a complaint, could, could complain either in the Queensland jurisdiction to the Queensland Human Rights Commission or to the Australian Human Rights Commission. And, and lastly, because it's happened at work, then um, there is a question of vicarious liability, whether or not the paid carer's um, employer might also be held responsible for her behaviour because, it, because it's happened at work. Uh, thanks, Amelia. Um, so we've just got one more poll that we're going to look at now. Um, so this one is, Amy was enjoying Friday after work drinks until her colleague sent her an explicit text message. He laughed at her with his mates as she read the text. Amy was so embarrassed that she did nothing until her colleague moved on from the organisation. The answers we have there are this may be sexual harassment, this may be a criminal offence, Amy has the right to complain to the Queensland Human Rights Commission, or all of the above. I'm just going to share that poll for you there. Um, and we'll see when the answers come in. So we've got some answers coming through that most people think that it's going to be all of the above. Um, at the moment, we're getting quite a strong response to this um, question that it is, um, yeah, pretty much everybody is going for all of the above. Um, just a couple more seconds in case anybody else wanted to submit a, a response there. Okay, thank you everybody for your participation in these polls. I'm going to close that one and share the responses. Um, so yes, we've got 100% of people who answered have said all of the above. What do we think? Yeah, so that was also the answer that Amelia and I, Amelia and I anticipated. Um, so all of the above, it, it may be sexual harassment, it may be a criminal offence. Um, she's got the right to complain to the Queensland Human Rights Commission. Um, and she, she may also have the right to complain to the Australian Human Rights Commission and she can um, uh, get some advice about making the choice between those two. Um, also, we would be wanting to not think about the time frame. So we know from the scenario that Amy hasn't chosen to take any steps until the colleague moved on from the organisation. Um, and so we don't know when this happened, if it might be um, more than a year or more than two years ago. So there is the ability within both jurisdictions to ask for an extension of time um, uh, when there are, well, you do ask for an extension of the time frame to make a complaint. Um, and so, you know, if there are people you are supporting where something has happened quite a long time ago, uh, it is still very important to refer someone on to get some advice, even if it is outside those one or two year time frames, because there can be ways to um, make submissions to the Human Rights Commissions to accept a complaint outside that time. Okay, so moving on, um, we just wanted to very briefly touch on the scenario where sexual harassment may also be a criminal offence. So um, some forms of sexual harassment may also be 
criminal offences such as sexual harassment, stalking or indecent exposure. So what we've been talking about today um, are complaint options under anti-discrimination law, which is a civil area of law and it's separate to criminal law uh, or you know, laws under the criminal jurisdiction. So we just wanted to flag that just because a person has decided to report to police or uh, is looking at making a complaint to a human rights commission doesn't prevent them from pursuing the alternative option. <clears throat> yes. And the other thing is, is that if what's happened to someone um, may also be a criminal offence, but they decide that they don't want to report to police, that does not stop them from bringing a sexual harassment complaint. So when sexual harassment is also may also be a criminal offence, um, uh, people should consider reporting it to the police. Um, they may be able to access uh, financial assistance from Victims Assist Queensland. They need to consider if they want to make a sexual harassment complaint and get some legal advice if they're confused or unsure which steps to take. Um, this is the overlap between the two areas um, where certain kinds of conduct might meet the definition of sexual harassment and also the elements of a criminal offence um, means that you can take both options, but it will be important to, to get some advice um, about uh, how those two interact. Uh, we can help. So um, if you have clients who you think may have been affected by legal aid, then you can, sorry, by sexual harassment, <laughs> you can refer them to legal aid for legal advice as soon as possible. So what kind of help do we provide? We provide telephone advice, to anybody affected by sexual harassment that occurred in Queensland. We also provide minor assistance to people in limited circumstances. So um, that might take the form of um, assisting them to draft a document in relation to a complaint that they um, are wanting to file. And lastly, we also provide representation with a grant of legal aid. So representation might take the form of assisting a client to make a complaint to one of the commissions and then attending, preparing for and attending the conciliation. Uh, it may also include assisting a client to prepare for a hearing at the tribunal or at court if their conciliation hasn't been successful. Just wanted to also point out that grants of aid are subject to a means and merits test. So what that means is a person needs to fill out an application form and send that into legal aid, it will be assessed against our means and merits test. So our means test um, is related to a person's financial means and the merits test considers a, a number of different factors, including the likelihood of, of the person's application having success, also including um, whether or not a prudent self-funding litigant would, would use their own financial resources and also whether or not um, there's likely to be a benefit to the applicant or the community um, in, in the use of public funds. One final point that I might note is that Legal Aid Queensland doesn't advise, assist or represent respondents to sexual harassment complaints. Um, it is only uh, complainants. Great. I just want to say um, a big thank you to both Gillian and Amelia today for your presentation on sexual harassment um, and for the level of depth that you went into to help all the community workers and health and education workers who have linked in today to better understand how they can help their clients and just to know that Legal Aid Queensland is here to help and that our community workers can call us anytime even when they're unsure just to get a bit more information and to know that you guys um, are working here and really happy to help so thank you so much for today we're going to run through some questions now so if anybody does have any questions that they'd like to ask Amelia or Gillian please feel free to send them through now we did actually have someone ask um, a question in the lead up to the webinar um, and I wonder if Gillian and Amelia you're able to respond to this. Would this be considered sexual harassment um, when one person is making comments 
about the body of another person, including a woman's hormone cycle. Sure. So um, I guess the the one of the things to be we we don't have a whole lot of detail about what the comment is, and I'm not I'm not asking for detail. Obviously, we can't we can't provide um, legal advice on a specific scenario in this setting. Um, but if somebody did want to get legal advice, they can call through and, and book in. Um, the key question, I guess, would be: Is the comment um, the specific detail of the comment is uh, is it sexual? Is it a, is there a sexual element to the comment um, when you you're talking about someone's body in relation to their hormone cycles? Um, and so the question of whether it's sexual might be quite broad. Um, when uh, we considered this comment, um, we thought important to note that um, while we're talking we're focusing on sexual harassment today um, but there are also protections uh, against sex discrimination and within the federal jurisdiction um, there is a protection against harassment on the basis of sex and both of those uh, protections in the law wouldn't require the comment uh, to be of a sexual nature um, but if it was an, a negative comment which was on the basis of someone's sex then it might fall within within those. So um, difficult to give any sort of certainty around a comment like that, but definitely something that it's important to, if, if there, you know, there was concerns and someone did feel um, they were being treated poorly in the workplace um, to get some advice about that. Thank you, Gillian. Um, are there examples anywhere which show some clear cut scenarios of sexual harassment that people can see or is everything very case dependent? Uh, if, if someone would like to, I guess, have a bit of a look around what might be examples, um, the Queensland Human Rights Commission does have some case study examples on their website um, which cover um, not just sexual harassment but looking at all different types of discrimination um, and so those sorts of case study examples might give you an idea about um, what sort of things have been uh, confirmed to be sexual harassment or sex discrimination or various other um, types of discrimination under the law. Um, I think that uh, because it, the the way the law is drafted, it is so context dependent, and it really does depend on you know a lot of different things um, coming together to to make it uh, to fall within the definition. So um, I think it's it's hard to give a firm answer as to whether you know it, because it could be that a certain thing said to one person. Um, so if you're with a colleague and you, you're saying things together, it may be that the conduct is welcome, um, but it might be that that conduct is not welcome in the context of someone you don't know as well, or someone who's in a position of power of you in the workplace. So it's really, it does depend on the relationship between the people a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Gillian. And it, and it does sound like, um, you know, you guys are here to help. If anyone's unsure, then it's best to just call Legal Aid Queensland and uh, book in for an advice session or ask for some further information just to get a bit of clarity around that. And it's good to know um, that the Queensland Human Rights Commission website does have some case studies so people could go there and have a look. And if someone um, has uh, been sexually harassed and they feel they've been sexually harassed but they just want to read those case studies for um, a form of support to confirm um, their situation and they they do identify with one of those case studies and want to go ahead with a claim of sexual harassment but they have missed the 12 month cutoff. Do you then recommend that they go to the Australian Human Rights Commission or uh, is there any leniency on that 12 month time frame? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, Amelia, did you want to? Sure, I can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sure. yeah. so there is an ability to make an application um, to ask for that time frame to be extended um, based on, on circumstances. Um, so, it would really depend on the conduct and um, I guess the reasons why the person may have only you know recently obtained legal advice or may have only recently thought about getting more information um, that would certainly be relevant to asking the Queensland Human Rights Commission for an extension of time um, and in terms of advising 
whether or not um, you know it's preferable to go to the Australian Human Rights Commission in, in that context. Again, it, it would really depend on um, the circumstances. It's mm -hmm. really difficult to give an answer. Yeah. Um, sometimes, I mean, yeah, sometimes it, it might be preferable to yeah. go with the Australian Human Rights Commission when a person's out of time. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really hard to give an answer. It would also depend on how much the person was out of time as well. Mm -hmm. um, Mm. Is there anything you wanted to yeah, add? just that the timeframes would be just one of the considerations in um, when we might advise someone which jurisdiction they they should think about choosing. Um, so it's an important one, absolutely, um, but might not be definitive. Yeah, of course. Um, and would something like um, confidence coming forward be something that's taken into consideration if somebody didn't get legal advice until say it had been 14 months, not within the 12 months? Confidence coming forward about what happened? Yes. Yeah, so I think um, there are all sorts of circumstances which could or would be relevant in, in trying to uh, ask for a complaint to be accepted. Um, if it's a little bit outside the time frame, I think um, what we, I guess, like, um, you know, people working with others in the community to know is that we really like people to refer as soon as they can to Legal Aid Queensland so they can get some advice. Um, and, you know, particularly if there is a time frame that might be ending soon or, or one that's ended recently, getting some advice um, at that point is really important. Thank you, Gillian and Amelia. Um, just looking back at um, when you mentioned sexual harassment in the workplace mm -hmm. um, and how sometimes an employer can also um, contribute to the fault of that sexual harassment. Um, if somebody feels they've been sexually harassed by someone of high power, for example, I know you've mentioned um, power dynamics and the employer doesn't support the decision to make a complaint of sexual harassment, what, what would you recommend um, a person in that situation do if they still want to make a complaint of sexual harassment against another employer, uh, an employee, but without the support of their employer? So um, the, I guess if the person's still in the workplace and they are at risk that they are, they're going to be subjected to further sexual harassment, um, the option that uh, Amelia talked briefly about of the stop sexual harassment orders in the Fair Work Commission might be something for that person to consider. So they can remain in the workplace and it can be safe for them. Um, so. I guess we're, we're sort of talking about the vicarious liability of the employer um, with this question and there is no, there's no need for an employee to have support or approval from their employer in order to bring a sexual harassment complaint. Um, it might be quite common to raise an issue in the workplace before taking other formal uh, legal options like complaints to human rights commissions or, or um, uh, at, you know, after trying to address it in the workplace. Um, but, you know, the, the question would be whether the employer has taken reasonable steps or all reasonable steps to um, ensure that that didn't happen in the workplace. That, that would be the key question for determining if that employer could also be held responsible for what their employee has done um, in sexually harassing someone at work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. No and um, just one final question today, um, just after, after some clarity around um, positions of power. Um, it's very case dependent, as you've said uh, many times. Can it still be sexual harassment when um, somebody is of the same position of power and there isn't a hierarchy there? Certainly, yes, it can be. Yeah, that's, so that's one of the circumstances that's relevant um, in considering, you know, whether the conduct um, humiliated, offended, um, or um, intimidated the person. But it's not it's not the only circumstance, um, and and certainly it can happen between colleagues who are um, 
who are on the same level. And I guess one of the takeaways that we wanted um, to really highlight today was that in Queensland, sexual harassment anywhere um, between anyone is 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 covered by this jurisdiction, covered by this legislation. It's it's not acceptable. Thank you so much. Um, and if you have any other top takeaway tips that you'd like to share with our audience today, uh, I'm sure they'd really appreciate it. Thank you for answering all of those questions um, and for your great presentations. And I, I know it can be a lot to take everything in. So if there's anything you just want to remind the audience of, we would really appreciate it. Sure. <clears throat> I think Amelia's just touched on one of the key takeaways, and that is that sexual harassment is unlawful everywhere in Queensland. Um, yeah. Um, the other takeaway that we've we've referred to a couple of times is that um, we really want you to refer your clients, even if in doubt, to get legal advice at any stage of um, the journey or the process, um, particularly earlier on even if the person is not in a position to decide what, if anything, they'd like to do. If they're able to get legal advice, then they're informed. Um, their choices will be informed. And it might also prevent them taking action, um, such as resigning from their job, um, if they're aware of what they can do to avoid that. Or, um, and it may also mean that they, they seek other support for their emotional wellbeing um, or other, you know, other kinds of support before um, things things may deteriorate further at the workplace or, or wherever it is this has occurred. Mm -hmm. And the, the final top tip is we wanted to really dispel um, any stigma or shame around making civil claims in relation to sexual harassment and really encourage people who've experienced this um, to to know that there is no there is no shame in um, in pursuing the legal options um, that are available to them. Thank you so much um, and thank you for re reiterating that there is no shame in this and we always want people to come forward um, if they're confident to do so and Absolutely. we will always try our best to help. Um, and so thank you so much Gillian and Amelia for your presentation today. It's been amazing to have your expertise, to have you both here to talk to our community workers about how we can help. Um, and if anybody wants to get in touch, we have our information line on the screen at the moment. You can also email webinars at legalaid qld.gov.au if you did have any questions that you wanted an answer to that weren't answered today um, and we can try our best to answer those or you can always book in a time. Uh, our office locations are on the screen here for anybody in Queensland who is nearby an office otherwise um, as Amelia and Gillian said we do offer phone calls and video conferencing as well um, so if you can't make it into an office you still um, very much have an opportunity to access our services in those ways. Mm -hmm. We do run regular webinars. We have one more left for this year um, and then we'll be starting up again in February next year. So if you did want to sign up to our list to hear about the webinars, then please head to our website and it's on our community legal education page. And we do offer free legal information publications. So please jump on to our website, find legal information and head to publications and resources. They are all free for download or they can be delivered to your community centre and you're welcome to hand out as many of these as you like. We cover the delivery costs, so please feel free to stock up your offices um, and have these on hand for your clients so that you can um, easily direct them to legal aid. All right, and that's all from us today. So thank you so much for, to everybody who logged in today. And thank you again to Gillian and to Amelia for um, such a comprehensive presentation about sexual harassment. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.